Coming up in this week's programme, we chat with Mark Sisson. Mark answers questions like, do you believe that a healthy diet is preventative medicine? What's your position on dairy? What exercises do you recommend? And so much more. The other week, Alan and I had the pleasure of interviewing Mark Sisson. Mark is a former elite endurance athlete who's made health and fitness his life's work. In his younger days, he was on track to go to medical school, but then changed tracks to follow the dream of making the US Olympic team for the marathon. As the years passed, he realised his calling was as an independent researcher, critical thinker, motivator and communicator. And his aim was to get people to take responsibility for their health and fitness, and at the same time, inspire them to be open-minded, passionate and enthusiastic about leading a healthy, happy, fit, balanced and active lifestyle, all done with the least amount of suffering, pain and sacrifice. So let's now join Alan and go over and continue our chat with Mark Sisson. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Primal Mark. For our listeners, we decided to call uh, Mark Sisson Primal Mark because we have another Mark on uh, on the interview as well, Mark Moxham, my partner in CREM. So, uh, kick break, uh, background for our listeners. Uh, Primal Mark, can you tell us about uh, yourself and how you came to Primal? I was uh, an endurance athlete in the uh, 70s and early 80s and, and uh, was uh, competing at a very high level, uh, doing all the things I thought I needed to do to be healthy in addition to being fit, which included running a lot of miles and uh, eating lots of carbohydrates. And um, um, over the years, I got pretty fast and I got pretty competitive at my sports, but I also found that I was falling apart from overtraining as well as from the um, – uh, highly inflammatory nature of a high carbohydrate diet. So um, after I retired at an early age from uh, uh, endurance competition, I started investigating ways in which I could continue uh, to become fit on much less work and see if that was even possible and to try and address some of my physical maladies, which were uh, numerous at the time because I developed a form of arthritis in my feet. I developed uh, uh, tendonitis in my hips. I had irritable bowel syndrome. Wow, you sound like you sound like an old man already. Well, I was and I was an old man at 27 or 28. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, my my investigations led me to uh, what we now know to be the paleo uh, sort of lifestyle, but I really uh, I I flavored it a little bit with a lot of other. Um, uh, lifestyle behaviors to come up with what I call the primal blueprint, which is this guideline for living a um, uh, a healthy, happy, productive, lean, fit life. And that's what I've been focused on for the last um, 25 years, is, is trying to figure out ways in which everybody can access, tap into this uh, genetic recipe that we all have to build a healthy human, but we've somehow uh, lost our way and thwarted it through some of the trappings of modern civilization and modern food production. Right, right. Well, since I'm a chef and nutritionist and not a doctor or scientist, I will mostly ask you food and nutrition questions. Um, can you tell us the, the basic tenets of the primal blueprint diet? Sure. The basic tenets are it's about getting rid of uh, some of these foods that cause problems. Generally, for most people, that would be getting rid of grains uh, because of the anti-nutrients that are found in grains. We can go into detail on that, but right. uh, it's about getting rid of uh, simple sugars, so soft drinks and sweetened drinks that people tend to live on these days, um, the desserts, the cookies, the, the pies, the cakes. Those are uh, quite inflammatory. Uh, and getting rid of the industrial seed oils, which we find sort of throughout the food supply now in processed food. So that would be the soybean oil, the corn oil, safflower, sunflower oil, um, those sorts of, of oils that are high in omega-6, pro-inflammatory um, omegas, and uh, right. low in the omega-3 oils. So those are th right. that's basically the, the th sort of the three categories, the grains, the sugars, and those, and those oils. And then what you're left with was, is a large list of uh, – Meat, fish, fowl, eggs, nuts, seeds, vegetables, a little bit of fruit. It's quite it's quite a cornucopia of wonderful things that we can eat. Right, right. Uh, speaking about the inflammation part, uh, there's kind of a chicken and an egg thing here. You you do mention, and I agree with you, that uh, 
uh, grains and uh, omega-6 uh, tend to be inflammatory, but uh, what do you think about the potential effect of gen genetically engineered ingredient on our gut health, which could start the whole inflammation problem as well? Uh, it's a big issue that needs a lot of research and a lot of work. Um, on the one hand, um, every food that we eat today is, is somehow genetically engineered in that it was selected for its sweetness or its uh, protein content um, over years and years and years of, of um, agriculture or, or farming. Uh, so right. there's a, there, we, we need to draw a distinction between that and taking the, the genetic material from an animal or a bacteria and injecting it into a plant and then genetically modifying that organism and, and selecting it because of its resistance to um, pesticides or fungicides. So right, there are right. a lot of – yeah, so uh, much of the food that we talk about today and that we, that we include in our diet has been modified. Right, but that's, that's – um that's yeah, like that's uh, crossbreeding, and so far, so far, it hasn't really made right. us sick. But what I'm seeing in my uh, clientele is that the past ten years we have an enormous resurgence of uh, uh, gut-related disease that did not exist before, even though we've been eating grains for for a long time. So that's why I suspect GMOs, which officially started to be commercialized around '96. Uh, has a strong effect on our gut health and the inflammation uh, situation. Yeah, and it could well be. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm being as conservative as I as I possibly can be, stating that um, I need I need to see science to make a a blanket statement. I'm suspect of of GMO products. Absolutely, I'm suspect. Right, and right. It doesn't make sense that um, that we could immediately introduce a brand new form of of food that has never been. Um, uh, consumed by humans and to which humans have not had any amount of time to adapt and expect everybody to to have a, 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 a benign experience with that new right. food. So, Right, right. It's not just a newness part of it. It's also the fact that in some case you're, you're introducing a toxin within the food like BT toxin. Absolutely. And at this point, uh, it hasn't been proven that this toxic uh, is not harming us. You know, that's the problem. I mean, once you start ingesting that food with the toxin, then some uh, people like Jeffrey Smith uh, are commenting that there's a transference. That toxin stays in our digestive system and starts to uh, completely destroy our, you know, beneficial bacteria, which is important. Oh, uh, it's very important. Yeah. I'm very suspect of these things. I just think that there's a, there's a lot, a lot of work that needs to be done. And there may be some benefit to um, to this concept uh, into the future, but right now it's it's a little scary to be taking Franken foods and testing them on ourselves or accepting them as universally, uh, right? You know, the the government would say generally regarded as safe. Well, you know, what does that right. mean? Generally regarded well, as safe. Yeah. Sorry to say, but I don't I don't trust uh, FDA or the USDA to tell us what's uh, safe for us to eat or not. Seriously, uh, Alan? Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> uh, call me call, call me a French skeptic, but um, yeah, I my big issue right now is GMO. Actually, I'm finishing a book on the subject, and uh, it's it's my battle, you know, mission right now to try to educate people into how potentially dangerous uh, genetically engineered food is, not even mentioning the what some people might see, the anti-God message that goes into that, but let's not get into this. Moving along, how is your version of the paleo diet different than uh, Dr. Cordain, uh, Rob Wolf, or Chris Kresser, for example? Yeah, well, it seems that these um, paths are starting to converge a little bit. When I first came out with the Primal Blueprint, uh, I wanted to be as inclusive as possible. So I, I looked at, uh, again, the science, and I, and I sort of um, parsed from that that probably everybody would benefit from uh, avoiding wheat, for instance, and most of the grains, the, the barley, the millet, the rice. Um, I but I also uh, recognize that uh, while paleo, strict paleo, seem to um, preclude dairy, there are a lot of elements of dairy that I considered uh, either beneficial or at least harmless 
uh, with a lot of people. Now, if you're lactose intolerant, that's a different issue. But if you have no problem with, uh, with lactose, if you retain the lactase producing uh, capability into your adulthood, then I saw that there were some aspects of dairy that might not only benefit health, but uh, actually you know, round out a diet and provide a lot more gustatory, gustatory pleasure um, by its inclusion. Similarly, there's, uh, there was initially a, um, an aversion to alcohol of all forms in the original paleo diet, and I, um, I, I recognized early on that there was a spectrum of, uh, mm. of uh, best choices to worst choices, and on the far end of the spectrum in terms of better choices was red wine, and so I sort of included that in the, uh, in the primal blueprint eating strategy. And then ultimately, I came out originally with a with the statement that I never met a saturated fat I didn't like. It's a bit of a blanket statement, but the reality is that um, I'm not as afraid of saturated fat as the initial uh, uh, investigations of uh, Cordain would have uh, supposed. And later, he's come around, as have a lot of other uh, people in the paleo community, to recognize that, that most forms of saturated fat are are probably um, beneficial up to a point, just like anything is benefit, or you know, any anything has a kind of a bell curve attached to it, and and uh, some amount of saturated fat is beneficial and healthy, and again adds to a well-rounded diet. So, um, but I see that the that the um, original paleo adherents who were strict paleo are starting to come around and appreciate um, saturated fat a little bit more. They're allowing a little bit more dairy. Um, a little bit of chocolate, uh, some uh, some red wine now and then. So I do see a convergence. Um, again, my 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 whole thesis here was eliminate the bad stuff um, that has been proven to cause uh, harm in a lot of people, and try it for thirty days or sixty days, and see what the effects are on you. And then, if you feel like you want to reintroduce some of those things uh, one at a time, and and uh, and and try to identify what the true culprit is, that's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at this from a pure uh, motivation of enjoying my life. I want to eat food that I enjoy at every meal. I want to enjoy every bite of food that I eat. I don't want to feel like this is a, uh, a diet at all. I don't want to feel like it's a lifestyle of deprivation. I want to feel like this is a lifestyle of inclusion. What can I eat? Tell me what I can eat. And I will right. include that on my list of things, and then as much variety as I can put in there, um, so that I, you know, I, I I get to experience as many of these sensory pleasures almost hedonistically, uh, because that's my my goal is to enjoy my life from here on out. Right, right. As a Frenchman uh, and a French chef, you got me at uh, red wine, chocolate, and there and che and cheese. Uh, oh yes. So, and I, I absolutely agree with you. The the food should be edible and tasty, otherwise people will not stick to it. Uh, for our low-carb crowd out there, which is, uh, um, at this point, the majority of our listeners, how would you uh, compare the primal diet to the Atkins diet, for example? Um, I think the primal print strategy is, and this is kind of one of the things I lead off uh all of my talks with, um, I do feel that the less glucose you burn in a lifetime, the better off you are. Yeah. Now, yeah. Right. With, with, within reason, that doesn't mean that everybody has to be in ketosis all the time. Um, what it does mean, however, is that this, this almost uh, blanket uh, approval or recommendation by, say, this, the, the U.S. government, that we should have three or four or 500 grams of carbohydrates a day um, is ridiculous. I think nobody, nobody other than a, an elite athlete or a or a, uh, a a very hard physical laborer requires more than say 150 grams of carbs a day to get to move about their life and be very functional and and fit and lean. Uh, so I created this carbohydrate curve years ago that identifies different ranges of carbohydrate intake generally. And again, this isn't. Uh, necessarily a, a hard and fast rule, but it's a guideline that, that basically stops at 150 grams a day. So zero to 50 grams of carbs a day, you can pretty much stay in ketosis. 50 to 100 is what I would call a good kind of low-carb strategy for a lot of people who want to um, gradually lose their excess body fat but still want to be able to enjoy meals that contain salads and steamed vegetables and, mm -hmm. um, and, and some fruit. Um, 
100 to 150 grams of carbs a day, which is generally where I land, uh, allows me to – as long as I don't have the sugar and, I, and I've cut out the, the bread, the pasta, the cereals and all the other forms of carbs that I used to have, allows me plenty of leeway to 